So the Brutusaur Mountain World of Warcraft Battle for Azeroth is being taken out of the game. I don't know why, but I know there have been numerous mounts, the earliest one being the Armani Warbear, which I'm still bitter about, by the way, that are no longer obtainable in the game. And so I told myself, dude, you can do this. Let's not live the rest of our WoW life without getting this one and being even more bitter about another mount that you didn't get and that you could have easily got. So I set off. I estimated that I only had about seven to eight months to do this, and I would really need to commit to it. I did what any normal die-hard neckbeard WoW player would do when I researched the shit out of some WoW gold-making videos. Now, the majority of the videos that I came across required you to have multiple max level characters, maxed out professions, or professions from another expansion, or recipes from an expansion that you can no longer get anymore, or they require the most oddball, insane materials that you have to, like, farm on one character, transmute on another character, send back to the main character in order to be able to sell on the auction house, and I didn't have that. Hell, I only had blacksmithing and engineering on my main paladin. I didn't like professions. There were auction house snipers, flippers, market watchers, market movers. The other route was multi-boxing. And I saw a lot of videos on how multi-boxing basically exponentially grows your income and pays for itself. But I didn't want to commit that hard. Isn't there something easier? Where's all the noob-friendly stuff at? What's something that I can just pick up and do? All of this crazy, complex stuff. And here's me just being inundated with so much information that I'm like, dude, can't we just play the fucking game? There's got to be a simpler way than this. And so I decided that I would create my own adventure and record my own results, not only on paper, but with OBS too. So I could go back and review all the things that I did and maybe make a little series for myself. And maybe help other people who are just starting off like me. So I started off with just simple emissary quests. The bonus is 2k and sometimes like once a month or so. There would be two of them up at the same time for the taking. So I did those and in each zone I would also do all the world quests that rewarded gold. Which averaged out to be another 2k. So in total like 6 I also realized that the table missions in BFA rewarded gold. And obviously, this seems completely RNG, but sometimes I'd get like an extra 300 gold on average per character for just logging in and queuing up the missions. Which, like, 300 times 5 characters? I had all 5 tanks at max level. No life, no shame, don't judge. That'd be a nice and easy 1500 gold on top of that. Plus, if you had max rep, your Paragon boxes would reward additional supplies, and of those supplies was something like 5,000 gold stashed away in there. But this just wasn't enough, and the emissaries weren't a guaranteed thing. And I shortly figured out that I was spending a lot of time just merely flying around to do these world quests that didn't really reward that much in the grand scheme of things. I remember reading from multiple sources on farming old raids that what would be the most profitable... I don't mind running old raids, but I don't exactly enjoy it. But I knew that the most profitable raids were from Mists of Pandaria. So I figured, what the hell, I'll give it a shot. This led me on a journey of doing weekly raids on at least two characters. My Paladin, because it's my main, and while I don't really do transmog, I figured any items that dropped that I couldn't sell, I might as well just go ahead and transmog them. Because... I obviously needed some kind of extra purpose for the drive and to hold me accountable to some sort of schedule. And my druid, because you can mount in raids, in some raids, and it's a worgen, and it has three sprints plus cat form movement speed increase with the feral talent. It's amazing how much time this saves, by the way. And so my weekly rotation for the raids ended up being Mists of Pandaria Heroics, Firelands, and ICC. And I even broke Mists of Pandaria raids into two separate things. Why was heroic mop raids better than running LFR mop raids? I later found out this greatly depends on what you want to do. If you're selling stuff on the auction house, heroic is better because of the trash drops and the motes of harmony, which turns into spirits, which sell on my server for about 90 to 150 gold a pop, depending on the market. 
But if you're looking at quick, raw, instantaneous gold, queue into LFR. Focus on killing the bosses, vendor all the gear, and while it's a little less money, it's a hell of a lot faster because you don't have to travel to each dungeon. And it's a bit more sensible to manage. I also wondered if there were more raids to farm and started a few tests, but I was getting kind of tired of raids and tired of tracking each character's lockout despite that I had an add-on to manage this. Blizzard, I think, actually made it surprisingly hard to farm certain old raids with the intent of making gold because some of the ones from other expansions don't reward much of anything besides bind on pickup transmogs. And I really started to wonder if there were dungeons that were just as profitable. And maybe even more profitable because who farms dungeons? I had started a spreadsheet aimed at keeping track of my gold making progress. And I thought, I'm going to go farm these dungeons and keep track of everything. And I'm going to figure out if there's anything remotely worthwhile to farm in vanilla dungeons. And it became a daunting task to try and keep track of everything that I got from drops, whether or not they sold, the amount of rare items that would actually drop on an average of five runs. But just to be on the safe side, I recorded all of this with OBS, and as I get time, I would really love to release this footage, even though it might not be worth it by the time it comes out. Because out of all these vanilla dungeons, I can tell you that the best dungeon to run for rare blue BOE items is Alderman. I can tell you that out of five runs in Dire Mall, I got a purple world drop. What are the odds of that? I can also tell you that the best place for me to farm thick leather is also in Alderman. The best and quickest place to probably farm rugged leather is in Sunken Temple. It's literally so fast that you should probably have two tunes with skinning on them on rotate because you lock out so fast. I can also tell you that depending on the price of low-level items, those grime-encrusted objects that you put in the machines in Nomergon are actually a ridiculous way to add to the amount of gold that you would get from a run that coupled with the BOE blue drops in there make it one of the most underrated farms because everybody hates Nomergon. All of this inadvertently became invaluable information to me because when I see something particular either not listed on the auction house or an item selling for a good price, I know exactly where I have to go, what I have to do, and what kind of gold per hour I'll be making in the process. But even with these tactics, this just wasn't enough. I realized that in order to make my goal of a million a month, I'd literally need to offset this with something more than just listing things on the auction house. And so began my journey of becoming a WoW Goblin. I guess that's what we're called, at least on Reddit, if I can call myself one. Anyway, up until this point, I had used Auctioneer simply because of the ease of use. And while Auctioneer is absolutely amazing for players, just kind of getting into more of like an advanced auction experience, it, it wasn't doing me justice for what I needed to do. And so I installed TSM, Trade Skill Master, which was daunting at first, but now like a paladin to my true core, I can see the fucking light. And I'm not that well versed in it. I've only really used the default TSM setup and I've only just scratched the surface putting items into groups and being able to sell them at different prices and managing operations. You see, when I'd farm these dungeons and raids, I didn't exactly want to vendor anything above white quality. I wanted to try and sell anything that I could, including the greens, the blues, the pets. I really wanted to try to maximize my income. So I searched and figured out a way to do exactly this. I split all the green items into groups and changed the operations in TSM so that they would be listed a little bit above their vendor value. I figured I can either vendor these greens or I could list them a few times on the auction house for like 20% more than the vendor value and try to make a bit more money. What would that hurt? If I didn't sell them, I'd just vendor them anyway. And the ones that did sell would sell for well over the price it would cost to continuously list them. And it actually worked. A little too well. I found that TSM has a sniping program. This is actually disabled now because of the way the auction house is redesigned, but I'll cover that in a little bit. I would actually have people sniping these greens and buying them and relisting them at a higher price. Cool, I thought. That was just going to run these raids next week, and I'd relist them again. And there's no way that these guys would continue to sell them for that amount of money. But in some cases, they did. And I'm like, well, shit on me. If I can make more money on these, why am I selling them to these snipers who'll just make money on my money? I couldn't have that. That's blasphemy. So I started listing them at the default market value in TSM, and nothing would barely ever sell. 
I had a backlog of about 4,000 greens just rotating through every 48 hours, and not only was it getting tedious to sell, it was costing me more and more and more money. After having a conversation with a few friends of mine, I realized that transmog is a completely lucrative thing. It isn't something that's based on any kind of traditional monetary value like you would think. It's literally based off of what the item looks like and whether or not a person needs it to complete maybe an unofficial set piece, a certain look or persona, and how much they're actually willing to pay for that item. Because what I didn't realize is that if an item is low quality, and it matches an outfit, a certain type of person will spend an upwards of 50k or more on a single green item, just because it completes that outfit. That's ludicrous to me. But maybe what that meant was that from my point of view, was that I'd have to inspect each piece and wonder whether or not this would be something I'd like to sell, like an actual store retailer. I didn't have the time for all this shit. I needed the money. I couldn't be spending time trying to evaluate what sells and what doesn't. So then, back to my keyboard I went, and like a confused little nerd who couldn't think for himself, I started asking the Google gods if there were any solutions to my problems. And I found that TSM actually has something called a region sale rate, which, if you know how TSM works, any player that's running TSM automatically contributes their sale data. So we can get kind of an idea just how much things are selling and what they're selling for. This doesn't actually track everything as precise as you think, because you legit have to be running TSM for this to be more accurate. And I think that because usually the people who run TSM are gold-making gurus, sometimes the price and values of things don't necessarily represent the general WoW server population or what like somebody maybe would traditionally buy or sell something for. Remember, these guys buy low, sell high, undercut, take advantage of certain auction house situations. But this does give me a pretty decent idea at the rate at which something like a certain popular transmog item would potentially sell for. And with that and my newly found understanding of wow fashion, I'd undercut the market value by a certain percentage. And then about once a month, I'd use my old formula to have a sale and actually try to push the inventory or products that didn't sell. The ones that didn't became vendor fodder anyway. And I was happy with that. Moving forward. There's only so many items you can collect, only so many items you can list and relist, and sometimes having a backlog of inventory isn't exactly a good thing. Otherwise, you end up wondering why you're spending so much time on this. I needed stuff that moved, stuff that moved frequently and regularly, stuff that people were always buying. And I remember from my early WoW days that mining and herbing were the two most profitable things in the game. We're talking those early days when you actually had to use a macro to switch back and forth between mining and herbing because you could only have one activated at a time. Yeah, we came a long way, didn't we? Anyway, I needed a farming tune. I knew that everything, no matter what you did in the game, revolved around gathering. These materials were required for potions, for gear, for runes, for tomes, glyphs, gems, anything. And they were always in demand. I knew I didn't want to use any of my tanks for gathering because it seemed so counterintuitive. Tanks do okay damage, but I found in some circumstances when I'd go urban mine, I'd be in what seemed like a minute-long battle with something, only for another mob to aggro or respawn, or someone else would pick my herb or mine my ore, and it would just despawn. And I became frustrated, and I thought, man, a class with a pet would be amazing for this, because the pet could tank the mob, I could herb or mine, and kill it quickly and then be back on my way. So I finished leveling my hunter, and began leveling up cult here and herbing and mining, and that was it. This was the sweet spot. Anchorweed was selling consistently for hundreds of gold. All the herbs and ores at my fingertips with no limits, lockouts, or resets, or how much or when I could farm. And being out and about in the world with no clear path or objective from one node to another, seeing people doing their own thing, oftentimes stopping to help others with world bosses or quests or whatever, doing a gold reward world quest just to add a little icing on the cake. Yeah, that was amazing. But it wasn't until some time after that that I really started thinking about time. You see, now that I had no lockouts and no restrictions, I had all the time in the world. And while I was consistently making around 20k an hour farming, I realized that I was spending an awful lot of real world time. Hours would go by, and despite the fact that I would listen to podcasts or audiobooks, I didn't want to spend this much time. I really only wanted to spend a few hours a day, if that. 
So I started to look for certain things that I could really use to optimize my time. The first thing I did was make the switch to using a sky golem with the herbalism enchant on my gloves. This allowed me to at least stay mounted while I herbed and cut a whole hell of a lot of time off. I never actually realized how much cast time is involved in summoning your mount. It actually adds up to be quite a bit. This is in conjunction with the time it takes to pick an herb or mine a node, and it's just an immense amount of time when you're talking about doing this for a few hours over the course of days and months to get your mount. There had to be something else I could do. So I did some more research to try and find any buffs, enchants, or potions to speed up gathering, and I found something called Dark Moon Firewater, which significantly decreases the amount of time it takes to collect herbs and ores. It literally probably narrows this down to like a one second cast time. And also this led to one of the best and most consistent gold making farms I think I've ever been a part of. Dark Moon Firewater can only be got by fishing in the Dark Moon Fair. And not only do these fish sell really well during the Dark Moon Fair, they also sell for a higher price when the Dark Moon Fair is not going on. You can also trade these fish for Dark Moon Firewater or just fish them out of the pools. Or you can get them out of the bloated fish or the crates while you're fishing. The price also goes up when the Dark Moon Fair isn't going on. So if you ever wanted a nice noob experience in buying low and selling high, buy your fire water during the fair in addition to fishing and sell it when the fair isn't going on. Oh, and also save enough for your own farms because that shit is fire. Anyway, there was only one thing left to eliminate, and that's the mounting. Now in BFA, they made two very distinct things, mono-hardened hoof straps and coarse leather barding. These allow you to interact with the nodes without dismounting, and also allows you to not get days when being attacked, and therefore dismounting. Both stackable, both amazing, and both pay for themselves with the amount of gold you'll be able to make by saving time. At this point, I had literally upped my income by around 10k per hour. I did this for months, each day feeding off the previous day's feel-good endorphins by opening my mailbox and seeing page after page of sales. However, there was a certain point in time that I just about lost all faith in everything. You see, the coronavirus happened, and while I'm not trying to put blame on that, or anything, or even anyone, I just wasn't mentally prepared for a downturn so soon. This was at a time when the expansion really started to slow down, and so the timing couldn't have been any worse. I believe the market became saturated because people were home and playing WoW. But because everyone already raided and did what they wanted to do, there was only really Mythic Plus dungeons and maybe leveling alts and farming for their own Brutusaur. And that made the competition a little fierce. It's also around this time that Blizzard decided to change the auction house completely. And I don't think I was prepared for that at all. Because things came crashing down. You no longer just listed stacks of items in quantities of 200 at a time. Items at the same price are now listed together with no stack limitations. And the system goes by the last in first out, which means the last person to list their item at a certain price gets the sale. I think maybe this is to prevent undercutting the market so much, but I really don't know. All I know is, is that it wasn't worth it anymore to list a bunch of things for a long period of time. It was better to try and list a mediocre amount of items at smaller intervals of time because you want to be close enough to that last seller. And what turned to steady income for me began dwindling down to a halt, to where the price of storm silver and anchor weed were reaching consistently new lows. I had to find alternatives, but I needed to break. I was getting burned out. And so I quit. I didn't play, didn't touch anything. All my auctions piled up and filled my mailbox collecting digital dust. And really, I guess I didn't see it coming, and I sort of embraced it. I still told myself that I wasn't giving up, but I needed to sort of, like, reevaluate things. And so, I gave myself a month. I began thinking about, like, what alternatives I could do and combine that with the knowledge that I had previously learned from farming. And I thought, alts. That's it. People are leveling alts and professions and doing all this low-level shit. I thought to myself, if I went out to these zones and literally min-maxed everything in that zone, to literally pick it dry and tried to sell everything that I collected that had some sort of use in leveling, a rare item, a profession material, a sellable quest drop, I could do it fast, efficiently, and have little to no competition in doing so. That's what I was going to do. 
and it was my most rewarding maneuver ever. The first thing I had to do was ditch the hunter. I had pre-purchased the Shadowlands expansion, so I had a boost available to me. And the first thing I did was boost another druid. My main druid has leather working and skinning, but I needed the mobility of that druid with the mining and herbing efficiency that the hunter had. These were low-level mobs, and so I didn't have to worry about aggroing anything because I could easily just one-shot it with Moonfire. I set off looking up old mining and herbing routes for vanilla zones, and I realized half of them were one or the other. You either mine this route or you herb that one. And the majority of these routes haven't really been updated for Cataclysm, so I experimented and made my own. I found that with Dark Moon Firewater, I could pick a zone so fast that I'd have to wait for the respawns. So I started joining these zones together by the herbs and the ores that they shared. Searing Gorge and Badlands became my first ever min-max farm. I bound Swift Flight Form to my mouse and Moonfire to an easily accessible key. I started in one corner, killing the spiders for Shadow Silk. With this, you can either sell the silk for around 15 to 20 gold or advertise or have a friend craft the shadow weave mass it's a recipe and i don't think you can get it in the game anymore but it sells consistently around four or five k i killed every rare that i came across and i don't know the rules of the loot table or if maybe nobody's farming these for transmog but the green rare items sell reasonably well i'd hit the whelps in the badlands and hopes for the whelpling to drop and at the end of the farm, I'd even swoop into Molten Core and round up some Dark Iron Ore and check the price of bars versus ore to see which sold more consistently for a higher price. I'd even take the bars and send them off to my pally, which was able to make the Dark Iron set and various weapons. These all sell for above 30k on my server, but it also takes the right buyer. And so I knew I was onto something here. I kept going, and I scoured the auction house for what would be my next greatest min-max. Swamp of Sorrows. For whatever reason, and I don't know why, Sorrow Moss sells for around 30 gold a pop. Swamp of Sorrows has a variety of wildlife, including spiders, and you guessed it, they drop Shadow Silk. Although, not at the same drop rate as the ones in Searing Gorge. They also have water elementals, and Essence of Water goes for around 2 to 300 gold. The Strangle Kelp by the Water's assistant seller at around 12 to 15 gold, and the Thorium Ore, while it sells for such a low price, has a chance to drop arcane crystals, which I literally cannot keep enough in stock. Not to mention all the while, I could leave my other druid by Sunken Temple and rotate out rugged leather farming on the lockout. I moved on, combining other zones and finding niche places to farm, like a little alcove in Feralis, almost instantaneous respawns of ghost mushrooms in a cave in Angoro, to my biggest gold-making min-max per hour ever, Burning Crusade where I combined the three zones of Terracar, Nagrand, and Shadowmoon Valley, knocking out herbs, ores, rares, and primals. The top consistent sellers, of course, being Primal Air and Primal Fire and Corium Ore, which consistently sells from 900 to 1,000 gold per. And I can never keep enough in stock. They constantly sell within a few days of listing them. And with all that, finding these niche things that nobody else seemed to really be doing... After five months, not counting the month I took off, obviously, I was able to finally get my Brutosaur. And that feeling of spending 5 million gold in less than one second didn't even phase me. I felt like it didn't even matter. And to top it off, I've only used the Brutosaur one time. To look up the price of an ore for a friend of mine who's also trying to get their very own Brutosaur. So was it worth it? Absolutely. You see, to me, World of Warcraft was always about adventure. And I think that's what I was missing from this game for a very long time. I didn't have to go and make sure I understood the strategy before a raid. I didn't have to know my character or be on the same page as everyone else in my group. I didn't have to jump through hoops. It was just me, uh, on my own, figuring out for myself. And I came up with my own way of dealing with my own problems in the game. My own strategy. And so really this gold making opportunity has given me another love for the game that I didn't quite know existed. Not only that, but it didn't occur to me the amount of stuff that you could actually buy with your gold. WoW tokens became Blizzard Balance, and I don't think I'll ever pay for another WoW subscription again. And I've bought store mounts with it, other games. And even if I never raid again, 
the opportunity exists for people to offer their services in exchange for my goods. Above all, I think that during a time when everyone's inside and cooped up, inundated by social media, news, and politics, and drama, it was a low-key sigh of relief to have this. To enjoy the old memories I had experienced in each zone when the expansion was current, to embrace the nostalgia and become absorbed in the ambience of each environment, and enjoy the atmosphere, and just listen to the world. And I don't know that I would ever take that back. So despite the fact that I rarely use this mount, I've gained something truly incredible and of so much value that it doesn't matter if they're taking this mount out of the game. What matters is that I did something that I never thought I would do or find enjoying, and I found it enjoying. And I may have found a new passion for this game that I've played for so many years. That is what matters.